Last night when I was on the way home, I got a message from somebody, and uh, he asks me, uh, what happens if uh, someone is looking for a shiduch and he can't find it, and uh, is it possible that he lost his shiduch? Is it possible he lost his shiduch? Is there anywhere in the Torah that he lost his shiduch? Now, he says, now he knows that things that I say in the shiurim, Baruch Hashem, he watches the shiurim, he says, I'm doing tshuva, I keep mitzvot, I keep Shabbat, ta, 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 I do all the things. But it's still possible because maybe, uh, you know, the parents are a little bit difficult, or the guy is a little picky, or the, this one. Is it possible to just lose the shiduch? So the only thing I know of for sure that causes a person to lose their shiduch is sins. Specifically speaking, wasting seed. When a person wastes seed, they could potentially get the punishment from heaven to lose their shiduch. Now, can they get it back? Yes, if they do tshuva, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu has mercy on them, like He always has on us, uh, then they could potentially get shiduch back. But the Gemara in Masechet Sota says that the, uh, the shiduch of a person comes based on his actions, based on her actions. If he's righteous, he gets a modest woman. If he's wicked, he gets an immodest woman. And the Gemara asks, what does one thing have to do with the other? If he's righteous, he should get a righteous woman. Not a modest. What does it have to do with the other? So Rashi on the place over there says, if she's modest, then most likely she's righteous. That's why the righteous guy, the tzaddik, gets a modest woman. If he's not righteous, if he's a rasha, then he gets a not modest woman. Why? Rashi says, if she's not modest, she's definitely not righteous. You cannot be righteous and at the same time an enemy of Hashem. Why an enemy of Hashem? Because anytime you're a woman and you walk around immodest, other people look at you, some of those people are Jews, some of those people are non-Jews, and they're going to look at you, and they're going to have iurim. They're going to have different thoughts in their mind. They're going to go to think, take them to places that don't belong. They're going to think of you in different ways, and different this, and different that, and they're going to end up making sins because of you, which means that you are a walking bio-nuclear weapon. You're killing people just simply by being next to them. They don't have to be with you. They don't have to touch you. They don't even have to talk to you. They, have to, they look at you one time, they see you, Hashem Achem, walking around, Imadist, that's it. You just killed them. So Kodesh Baruch says, you're just killing my kids. You're killing my creation. How could I love you? How could I expect, accept your prayer? So a person that uh, is a Rasha gets a woman that's a Rashaid. How is she a Rashaid? She walks around Imadist. Even if she puts on the candles for Shabbat, even if she keeps Shabbat, even if she eats kosher, if she's not modest, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says she's in the book of Rishayim. Now this is a very, very difficult thing for women to accept because many women love the mitzvot. Some women, I wish, I wish they were guys. Some of the women that watch the shiurim, I wish they were guys. They are, mamash, the best students in the world. They show up on time unlike you people. They, uh, they, uh, they do a lot of good things. They do a lot of good things. They learn every shiur. Not like they're doing me a favor. They watch, they love the shiurim, they send questions, they give answers, all types of wonderful things. These women, I wish they were guys. But the problem is, they dress like guys. Why? Well, they walk around with tank tops. They walk around with shorts. And that's a problem. Why? Because all of the shiurim Torah that you're watching are all going to the sitra akhra. They're all going to give power to the satan. Why? Because unfortunately until you do tshuva for modesty as a woman, you simply are putting yourself in the book of Rashaim. So that's why Rabbi Karim, it's very, very critical for a woman to be modest. And I know it's difficult, because the Yetzirah tells you it's too hot. The Yetzirah tells you it's too old. Makes you look like an old lady to put a kisu rosh on. Makes you look like an old lady to put a long skirt on. Makes you look like this, makes you look like that, which is all stupid and lies. Why, I've never seen a modest woman complain about her clothes. I've never seen a modest woman complain about how she looks. All of the questions that she has is usually before she starts putting on modest clothes. After she decides, okay, from now on I'm wearing modest clothes, she doesn't complain about it anymore. Why? Because she realized the whole thing is fake. It's not too hot. And she doesn't look like an old lady. And the reality is she's finding that people are finding her even more attractive. A husband finds her more attractive. Yeah, but what about a woman that has a husband where he tells her, listen, you put on a kisur rosh, I'm leaving you. You put on a mitzvah on your head, I'm leaving you. 
The Zohar Kadosh says on a person like this, that husband is ahul. He's cursed from heaven. He's not going to be able to have good living. Whatever money he makes is all going to go to bills. It's all going to get a medical expenses. It's all going to go to the IRS. He's not going to have any bacha in his panasa. He is cursing himself by telling his wife not to put on kisulosh. Does she have to listen to him? She's forbidden to listen to him. Doesn't matter what he says. He can yell, he can scream, he can do whatever you want. He can even threaten to do a get. Say to it, give me a get then. I'd rather you give me a get than give me geinum. And she should tell him. That's the reality. So now a woman that's not modest, she's married, she doesn't put Kisul Rosh on. She's not modest she, even if she's single. She has a very serious problem with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Because she's creating sinners. So now, since guys today, standard guy, unfortunately has sinned many times, either by himself or with somebody, even sometimes with his own wife. He didn't know he wasn't allowed to do certain things. So Chazal gave us a special tikkun, special auspicious time, auspicious time to do tikkunim for the Brit, which is during the entire time that we read Sefer Shemot, Exodus. We start with the blessing where we see that Am Yisrael went from being 70 people at the end for the first over 2,400 years or more. Uh, 2,600 years of creation, what do we finish with? At the end of Sefer Bereshit, 70 Jews. That's what we had. The first half of this world. We have, let's say, around 5,700 years or so, 5,780. First, almost 3,000 years. Almost 3,000 years. How many Jews we have in the world? We have 70. Yaakov Avinu, the Shvatim, their wives, that's it. Grandkids, that's it, finished. 70. Already, beginning of Sefer Shemot, you're not fast-forwarding that much. 200 years. We're already in the millions. The Midrash Me'am Loe says we were in the hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. We're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, like today we have 15 million that we barely even know if they're Jewish or not. No, we're talking about hundreds of millions. Hundreds. So you're going to say, wait a minute, where, where do they all go? The Midrash Me'am Loe says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Bnei Israel, okay, it's time to leave the slavery, it's time to leave the Avodah Zarah, it's time to leave Egypt, let's go. Go to the desert, get to Mount Sinai, accept my Torah. Unfortunately, they didn't want to leave their Avodah Zarah. They didn't want to leave their business. They didn't want to leave their house. They didn't want to leave. Why? They said, listen, we were slaves already for over a hundred years over here. Finally, we're not slaves. Let us live in peace. We don't want to go into the desert. There's danger over there. There's scorpions, there's snakes the size of houses. Who wants to go in such a place? Some people from the tribe of Ephraim left early, or Benjamin left early. They got killed in the desert. We want to go. No, we're going to stay here. Yeah, but don't you realize that Akadosh Baruch Hu is the one that told you he's going to protect you, he's going to take you? No, oh no, they, they forgot that part. It's like, you know, people say, yeah, I like Shabbat. I just, uh, I like driving more. I say, yeah, but don't you realize that Akadosh Baruch Hu is the one that says don't drive on Shabbat? Because when he say it, I said fourth commandment. Fourth commandment, he says, do not drive on Shabbat. No. God said it. Fourth commandment. Go look. Go look it up. Don't drive on Shabbat. God said it. Now you're going to move in. So what happens? People, uh, oh, wow, he really said it? Oh, wow. Oh, okay, so if he really said it, listen now, go, it's hard. Wait, but you said that the only problem is that you didn't know that God said it. Now I showed you that God said it. Now how come it's still hard? Well, you know what happens to people that say, oh, it's hard? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Am Yisrael, leave Egypt. Leave the Avodah Zarah. Leave your houses. Go to the desert where it looks dangerous, but don't worry, I'll take care of you. They say, we're not ready, it's hard. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you know what, it's hard? Okay, so I'll kill you then instead. And he killed 99% of them. 99% of them. That's what the Midrash Miram Loi says. It says only two people out of every million, only two people out of every million left Egypt. One out of every 500,000. Now some say, no, no, it was 20. It was 20 out of every 100, meaning 200,000 out, uh, out of a million. That's the conservative estimate, meaning he killed 80%. But the Midrash Miram Loi says, no, Everybody knows it's not that. They're just trying to make you feel good. 
Everybody knows it's nothing less than one out of five five thousand, but in reality it's possible it's one out of five hundred thousand, meaning two out of every million. Why? They said it's hard. It's hard to keep the mitzvah. It's hard to leave the this. Okay, it's hard. Okay, you lost your right, your right to exist. Now, how many did we have? Many. How do we get so many? It says in the beginning of parasha, paru v'yishretzu v'yirbu v'yatzu b'meod noad v'yitemale ha'aretzotam. In the first chapter, verse number 7, it says the children of Israel were fruitful, teamed, increased, became strong, very, very much so, and the land became filled with them. And Chazal on the spot over there says that for every adjective, every description that magnified their, their, uh, their um, uh, success of increasing is one baby, is describing one extra baby in every birth. Meaning, since there are six adjectives describing their increase in population, every birth was six babies. Every time a woman was carrying for nine months, six little babies came out, sometimes more. So imagine, average little couple, they get married, they're 16, 17 years old. You know, in those days, it weren't like today, married at 45. In those days, sometimes they get married 12, 12 years old, they're already married. So imagine, little 16-year-old, she already gave birth to a second pair already. She's got 12 kids. Shtabach Shimo. By the time she's in her 30s, she's got 60, 70 kids. You need, a, you need an 18 wheel to feed them breakfast. What do you want for breakfast? By the time you finish getting the orders, it's already lunch. <laughs> By the time you get the order, you're already, already lunch. You're producing them, producing. But guess what? You got helpers too. You got a lot of free help. But that's how we got to the point of being millions. Meaning, Akadosh Baruch Hu says, in order to get you from being just a few million to being a few billion, it's easy for me. In order for you to go from being homeless, mamash, homeless, in the streets with nothing to eat, to being the richest man in the world, Hashem says, in a second I can do it. Yosef at Sadiq was worse than homeless. Worse than homeless. He's in jail in a hole in the bottom of the ground. Twelve years he's there. Genom was looking at it, he's like, you know what, maybe we're going to do some of the things they're doing in that jail. He's got good ideas over there. That's how bad the situation was in his jail for twelve years. One second, same day, within a matter of minutes, becomes the king. The amount of money that Paro gave him on day one, the signing bonus, made him the richest man in the world. Rabotai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, it's easy for me to turn your situation around. To you it's hard. Why? Because you're thinking you have to do something. You have to go make money, you have to go get a job, you have to go sign a deal, you have to get a good client, you have to have this, you have to have that. Kadosh Baruch the only thing you have to do is be glued to me. Glued to me, I can do anything I want. Why? Because now you're not giving me any reasons to destroy your bracha. Now, the problem is, Rabotai, is that when we teach mitzvot, when we teach mitzvot to little kids, we teach mitzvot to converts, we teach mitzvot to Baalei Tshuva, really what you're supposed to teach, you're supposed to first teach them what not to do. Not what to do. What not to do. Don't drive on Shabbat. Don't eat chelev, which is non-kosher uh, uh, meat, part of the uh, cow. Uh, don't eat non-kosher meat in general. Don't uh, you know, hang out with uh, bad people. Don't do illegal business like cash advance and otherwise. Don't do a lot of this stuff. Why? Because if you do it, you're going to lose a lot of Yeah, what about put on tefillin? What about, uh, you know, have a nice candles for Shabbat, you know, spend three, four hundred dollars just on the things that hold them? What about that stuff? It's nice, right? Yeah, it's nice, but it's not significant enough to teach you that first. What's the most significant? First, teach you what not to do. What not to do. That's how the Torah works. This is why the Torah says, first we have to fear Hashem, then we have to love Him. And Chazal explains, because we do not decrease in Kedusha. The first, you cannot teach a person to just love Hashem. Why? Because loving Hashem is to a lesser extent than fearing Hashem. It's a lesser extent. Now, when a person understands that Fear Hashem is critical. Already he knows. Already she knows. Okay, what does it mean fear Hashem? A bunch of stuff not to do. 
Don't go to places that you're not supposed to go to. Don't do certain things you're not supposed to do to. So when you fear Hashem, already it alleviates all of your crimes. All of the things that are destroying the blessing that Hashem wants to give you. Now when a person does not have real fear of Hashem, or he has fear of Hashem sometimes, when it's convenient, you know, like one of those people, he fears Hashem until he doesn't. She fears Hashem until there's a uh, wedding. She fears Hashem all year. All year she puts a kisur rosh on, but if somebody's getting married, all of a sudden the kisur rosh goes in the laundry. She forgot it. Home. He, uh, he is a uh, tzaddik. Kasher goes daf yomi, daf sheni, daf this, daf that. All the shurim. He does everything. But one of his friends says, listen, you want to go to a basketball game? Want to go to a basketball game? Oh, sure, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Well, what else would I be doing? Oh, you're not going on a shoe that night? No, no, sure, I get the next night. Next night, I'm on the way shoe. What does it mean? It means that all of the times that he did mitzvot, all of that yirat shamayim that he showed people, it's all fake. Why? He didn't have any, any, any yetzara. Yetzara showed up with a basketball ticket. Yetzara showed up with a girl. Yetzara showed up with a guy. Yetzara showed up with a dog. Yetzara showed up with a cat. Whatever. Yetzara shows up, he gives up everything. He throws a sham in the, in the laundry. So that's, uh, that's what I mean by it says Yetzirah, they have Yirat Shemaim sometimes. It's fake. It's not Yirat Shemaim. It's either you have it or you don't have it. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I want to give you blessings. Look what I did to Bnei Israel." even before they kept my entire Torah. I multiplied them to the extent where they went from 70 people to millions, to hundreds of millions. That called too, that everything, until obviously Paro changed the whole deal, everything else, they were doing okay, they had their own city, they had everything. Why did he change it? Why did Hashem change the whole thing? Because Bnei Israel started peeking into the world of the Goim. Oh, they have basketball games there. Let's have basketball games in our synagogue. Oh, they have uh, football over there. Let's have football league uh, in our synagogue. Oh, they have a casino there. Let's have casino night in our synagogue. They started peeking into the world of the Goim. So Goshen turned into a mini Las Vegas sometimes. Not all year round, just sometimes. Kadosh Baruch says, either you're with me or you're not with me. You're not with me. You're with the Goim. Okay, so I'll let the Goim take control. We lost the blessing not because we didn't do mitzvot. We lost the blessings because of sins. We lose the blessings because of sins, not because mitzvot. That's why Rabotai, Sefer Shmot, is a key opportunity for all of us to do tshuva, for immorality. Immorality includes wasting seed. Immorality includes promiscuity. Immorality includes immodesty. Immorality is something that in a Kadosh Baruch Hu's eyes, this is the symbol of, of the Torah. This is the symbol of Judaism. This is what distinguishes us from all of the other nations. Kadoshim to you, ki Kadosh Kadosh Baruch Hu says. You be holy because I am holy. And what makes a Jew more holy than a non-Jew? Modesty. A non-Jew doesn't have chupay and kiddushim. He wants a girl. She wants the guy. No problem. They're not allowed to chas v'shalom, uh, adultery or rape or anything like that. But they like each other. They want to be together. No problem. You don't have to go to court. The guy goes with the girl. They go, they go to the same house. They're intimate. That's it. In Hashem's eyes, they're married. Now, the next morning, they both wake up Tisha B'Av. They don't like each other anymore. They don't have to go to the divorce office. They, they said, okay, I don't like you, I don't like you, goodbye. Okay, we're not married anymore. Not married anymore. Now, should they be promiscuous, do this every day? No, obviously not. A Kadosh Baruch Hu will hate that. But the point being, there's no chupay and kiddushim for non-Jews. But to be a Jew, ooh, ah, you have to go through a... Uh, DNA tests these days. If you're Ashkenazi, they actually do take DNA tests. Why? Because there's certain things in the blood of Ashkenazim that if uh, that could actually create certain diseases that they're careful of and so on. When two Ashkenazim that are religious get married, before they get married, they do tests to see if Chas Shalom, the two blood types are uh, are a bad match, if you will, and it could create uh, problematic children. 
This is in recent generation. In the past, they wouldn't do it. But the point being, Rabotai Karim is that even without the DNA test, before you get married, before you get the girl, before you get the guy, ooh, wah, you have to have the interview, the rabbi, the father, the mother, the brothers, this, that. Who's our brothers? She have good brothers? She doesn't have good brothers? Oh, forget it, forget it. What do you mean? But her brothers, what does that have to do with her? Listen, if her brothers are like that, maybe the, all types of, all types of things. Then finally, okay, she likes him, he likes her. Oh, the brothers are good, the sisters are good, everything is good. Okay, how much money you got? What do you mean how much money I got? Don't you just want the girl? No, no, no. Want the girl and the money. Yeah, but I don't have any money. Okay, you don't have any money. You can't have my son. What? What do you mean? I need this. I... Oh, what? Ah, oh, it's Mesirut Nefesh to get married. Then finally you agreed on the money. You've signed it all. Everything is good. Okay. Now you have to have a Ketuba. You got to go to Ketuba. You have to understand what does it say. Oh, you're buying this girl. What does it mean buying this girl? You're not buying anybody. No, no, I'm really buying you. You're mine now. How much are you going to give me if you don't do this? You have to agree. How much are you going to give her if you mess up? You mess up, you decide you don't want her next week? Okay, no problem, pay for it. Why? Because a bat Israel is not some putza. It's not some zona that you could just get from the street. A bat Israel is expensive in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's eyes. You can't just rent her for a week. You mess up. You think you're fooling around. You think that you're having a game. You're going to touch a bat Israel Rabotai. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. No, no, but she likes me. If you don't have a ketuba, a kadosh b'chu doesn't like you. A kadosh b'chu doesn't like you. If you don't have a ketuba, you didn't sign a ketuba, and you're touching a bat Israel, a kadosh b'chu says you have a, you have business with me. You have a problem with me. Why? You're touching my daughter without even talking to me. So unfortunately, many of us never knew any of this stuff, growing up. So. You thought you had a kosher relationship, everything was good. She was even Jewish, he was even Jewish, everything is good. Akadosh Baruch Hu says, without Ketubah, you have a very serious problem. Why? Without a Ketubah, she's not allowed to go to the mikveh. She's not going to the mikveh. You touch her, you, you, you do something with her. By the way, what would you do? Isur karet, nida. You go to Parashat Kedushim in, in the book of Leviticus, I think it's chapter 20, verse number 17, says what happens to a person with a nida? Karet, i karet. What's Karet Yegel? Genom. How long? Forever. Just a little bit longer. Why? I was having a good time. Okay, have a good time. You touch my, Kedosh Baruch says, you touch my daughter without a Ketubah, without a Mikveh, you have a serious problem.